we will continue the program of the second international symposium on food science, SINCA, with the lecture entitled Role of Soybean Proteins and Peptides on Health, which will be given by Dr. Elvira Gonzalez de Mejia. Dr. Elvira, Elvira Gonzalez de Mejia is a full professor at the College of Agriculture, Consumer and Environmental Sciences at the University of, of Illinois, United States. She has published more than 200 articles in the area of food science and works mainly on topics related to bioactive peptides and proteins in food that promote health benefits for reducing inflammation, markers of type 2 diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Elvira de Mejia, on behalf of the organizing committee of the Second International Symposium on Food Science, we appreciate your availability to give this lecture with a topic of great interest in our area. Professor, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Vianne, for that kind introduction. I want to thank Professor Ferreira for this kind invitation to be part of your extraordinary International Symposium of Food Science. I bring you greetings from the University of Illinois uh, and hoping someday you can visit us there in Illinois. Uh, I want to acknowledge all my, all my students uh, throughout the years that have participated in, in, the, in the research I'm going to share today with you. <clears throat> so this is the outline. We're going to talk about regulatory pathways associated to the role of dietary proteins and peptides, and briefly talk about the potential mechanisms of action of these proteins and peptides, how they can modulate chronic diseases. Then we will talk about types of proteins in soybean. Remember, not, not all soybeans are the same, and not all proteins are the same. So we need to uh, talk about the uh, diverse group of proteins in soy, and also the types of peptides that are naturally present in soybean, but also the ones that can produce using different enzymes and treatments in order to produce soy ingredients. And then conclusion and some recommendation for future studies. Let's get started. So first of all, uh, we, we wrote a review paper in molecular nutrition and food research some years ago, talking about cardiovascular disease. How can we prevent cardiovascular disease? And we talk about how dietary proteins and peptides can have a role in decreasing or preventing this uh, terrible disease. So we notice that proteins and peptides have anti-inflammatory properties, antioxidant properties, and those are very, very important properties in soy proteins and peptides since they will inhibit vascular um, reactivity and also are antithrombotic. We can see that several peptides are hypocholesterolemic, hypotriglyceridemic, and also antihypertensive. So uh, this is a very interesting review some years ago, but it, it tells us about the beauty of dietary proteins and the peptides that can be produced when we digest these proteins. Also, another review in cancer and metastasis reviews uh, talks about how some peptides and proteins can uh, decrease or even prevent some cancer um, events like in inhibiting proliferation, arresting cell cycle progression, inhibiting oxidation, and, and you know, again, anti-inflammatory effects. So anti-inflammatory effects, antioxidant uh, are very important properties present in peptides and dietary proteins. So these are some of the modulation, uh, in modulating immune response of some of these proteins and peptides. So um, these are important to promote health. So the consumption of dietary proteins and, di uh, and peptides help us to control and improve our health. So uh, consumption of pulses, such as beans, peas, lentils, is associated with improved cardiovascular health and lower blood serum cholesterol levels. Pulses, like the ones shown here, are inexpensive food sources available worldwide, rich in fiber and protein to major components of our diet and good for our health. The addition of certain pulse proteins to high cholesterol and saturated fat diets has been shown to reduce 
blood cholesterol levels in animal studies. So mechanisms of action are still not very clear, but we need to study how proteins in pulses can reduce the absorption of dietary cholesterol and in, in, in human digestive system, how these peptides are produced and generated through the hydrolysis of pepsin, pancreatin, other enzymes like trypsin, chymotrypsin, and how they are digested in the small intestine in the colon, and how these very high protein sources are uh, good for our health. Soybean is here, <laughs> as you can see, it contains bioactive compounds such as saponins, isoflavones, some peptides that we will talk more about them in future slides. Soybean composition, it varies a lot among varieties. Here we have 15,000 of different varieties in Illinois that come from different sources around the world. And the protein concentration can go from 38% to sometimes 50% of protein. And that delivers very high concentration of bioactive compounds. Phytochemicals, as I mentioned before, so as isoflavones and saponins, oil, high quality oil, insoluble dietary fiber, and soluble carbohydrates, some, some, such as this uh, carbohydrate shown here. So it's a very interesting grain for human consumption and animal consumption as well. I want to mention some of the most important proteins in soybean. Kunitz inhibitor, trypsin inhibitor, bauman birk inhibitor. You know, these two uh, peptides were associated with um, decreasing digestive uh, digestion in our system, but also there are many studies relating these two peptides with biological activity. So there is a lot we still need to, to study about the different components in soybean. Uh, alpha conglycinin in this uh, group of proteins, and then larger molecular mass proteins such as beta conglycinin, gamma conglycinin, alpha amylase, lipoxygenases, and a very interesting group of molecules called lectins. Of course, soybean provides an allergenic protein such as protein P34. This is an allergen for some individuals that are allergenic to soy. And then the larger molecular mass proteins such as glycinin per se, pure glycinin, and others. So not all soy Soybean varieties are the same, and not all proteins in soy are the same. So we need to select those varieties of soybean that provide healthier uh, proteins for our diet. Uh, this is just to highlight two very important storage proteins in soybean, which is beta-conglycinin. It contains, is an homotrimer. This is the crystal structure. And for glycinin, it's an hexamer and also um, this is the crystal structure. So please remember beta-conglycinin, and I will be talking later about our findings, but this is a very unique protein that provides bioactive peptides. And glycinin is another storage protein, but um, we haven't been able to find very high biological activity peptides in this um, protein. When you test different varieties are here, MB1 all the way to MB7, it gives you different varieties of soybean. And uh, when you uh, run it in a gel, electrophoresis gel, you can see different bands of different proteins. So if you see this uh, set here inside this um, circle, you can see beta-conglycinin is a trimeric, as I was telling you, protein with different bands. The, the, each band may represent several proteins, but in this case, uh, we're calling them, you can read the names here to your right, and the glycine also contains different proteins. So it's important to identify the different proteins profiles that are present in soybean. Uh, one of the unique peptides present in soy that is naturally present is lunacin. This is part of the albumins, and, and, and we know that several soy proteins have been found to have anti-cancer properties. For example, lunacin, this is a, a 43 amino acid peptide that has been found to selectively stop mitosis 
and induce apoptosis of cancer cells. A Bauman Birk inhibitor and lectin are also found to inhibit growth of cancer cells. Just recently, one visiting PhD student from Mexico, uh, he found that when he puts lunacin with liposome inside liposomes, he was able to almost inhibit tumors in mice that were exposed to cancer human cells, cancer cells. So lunacin and this lectin and bauman birk inhibitor, inhibitor are very unique um, components of soy. So I selected some unique and uh, classic studies that have been published mentioning the uh, soy proteins in human obesity. And several of these studies show that they decrease hunger, that they increase uh, metabolic rate, that they promote weight loss and maybe also decrease visceral adipose tissue accumulation as well as improve serum lipids. So these are some of the studies, classic studies on soy, some soy proteins, and there are others that propose the mechanism of action, for instance, regulating satiety and food intake, decreased lipid absorption and modulation of lipid metabolism, and increased thermogenesis. We have seen this clearly when we inject in the brain of animals certain peptides, um, and certainly the animals with no exercise, they were decreasing body weight and lipid accumulation due to thermogenesis. So there is innovation of adipogenesis as well. So some of the mechanism without going into too much detail, these are some of the mechanism of action associated to soy peptides. Uh, for instance, in this classic study from Alison et al, they study 100 of these patients and they gave them a diet rich in soy protein isolate uh, they call it a meal replacement five times per day. And then they did only counseling for other volunteers during three months. So what happened? Uh, they can see that the weight lost that the people in the volunteer group on low calorie meal replacement lost weight. And you can see here how much, depending on the week, four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, versus the control that did not lose weight, statistically speaking, there was not um, a weight loss um, in kilograms of these volunteers. Another study using only soybean beta conglycinin described what happened in serum. Uh, so they found that these obese men and women, 102, were randomly uh, distributed in two groups. One, that they offer a candy based on beta conglycinin from soybean, five grams of soybean beta conglycinin versus a candy, the same five grams based on casein. And the results show that the group that ate the beta conglycinin candies decreased, statistically speaking, these are average, of course, of many people, but the statistically speaking, they decrease the weight, uh, the BMI, and also the body fat. There was an important increase in adiponectin and also a decrease in free fatty acids in comparison to the case in group that didn't show these different uh, parameters. So it's important to compare different proteins because proteins are different <laughs> um, for their biological activity. And again, these um, researchers propose a mechanism of action for soy, this soy protein. So the production of peptides that contain biological activities were able to increase uh, colocystokinin that decreased gastric emptying and increased satiety, as well as finally they found a decrease in food intake and body weight. So those are some of the studies, classic studies that have been already published. My group, in collaboration with many scholars, have um, demonstrated that beta-conglycinin has very important active peptides that are able to inhibit the accumulation of fat in adipocytes. So these were in vitro studies and also hydrolyzing beta-conglycinin using different enzymes. We have been able to demonstrate that several varieties of uh, soy, mainly the ones that contain higher concentrations of beta-conglycinin, were able to inhibit lipid accumulation and inflammation in vitro. So it's important to start 
eh, with biochemical essays in silico, in vitro, before you move on to animal studies or human studies. So this other study in my laboratory, and again, I don't have enough words to thank all my students and visiting scholars providing this very important information. So we can see here the inhibition of lipid accumulation and inflammation uh, based on how we can do to inhibit one very important enzyme, which is fatty acid synthase. We were able to modulate using molecular um, representation of the crystal structure of the enzyme, this fatty acid synthase, and go to the thioesterase domain and see that the peptides we were producing were able to inhibit the enzyme at the same level as, than early stat. So out of this study, you can see here to your left, the average inhibition of the lipid content um, versus the control. When, you, when we use milk, that was hydrolyzed with alkalase versus beta conglycinin that was also hydrolyzed with alkalase as we increase the concentration of beta conglycinin from 25% to 45%, we were able to see the increase in the inhibition of lipid content versus a control. To your right, you can see a figure that relates the lipid accumulation inhibition versus a control in adipocytes that were exposed to different concentrations of beta-conglycinin as we increase the concentration of beta-conglycinin up to 100 micromolar, we saw an inhibition of lipid accumulation. This is beta-conglycinin versus glycinin, the other important protein, storage protein in soy that did not show any inhibition in lipid accumulation as well as the induction of adiponectin in adipocytes after we treated beta-conglycinin and glycinin with alkalase, one enzyme that um, we have used a lot in our studies to see what kind of peptides are produced. And the same, we saw an increase in low molecular mass and high molecular mass of adiponectin. Those molecules were increased when we exposed the, uh, the adipocytes to beta-conglycinin, but didn't happen when we exposed those to glycinin uh, hydrolysates. So let me share with you one study in humans uh, that we did um, some time ago. The objective was to compare the effect of consuming low glycinin soy milk with conventional soy milk and compare it with bovine milk on body fat accumulation and biomarkers of oxidative stress and inflammation. So we measure different parameters. This was a double, double blind placebo control, control randomized human trial. And of course, we had all the health questionnaires. Uh, we had um, one week of washout period, no soy products in that one week, and then three months of milk consumption, uh, measure anthropometric measurements, body fat, body uh, blood analysis, and microbiota analysis. So in summary, let me share with you that we use three main groups, 12 grams of protein per day were consumed based on low glycinin soy milk, that represented 50, almost 50% 50 of beta-conglycinin in this milk versus a conventional milk that also contained 12 grams of protein per day, but almost half, almost 27% of beta-conglycinin versus bovine milk that also contained 12 grams of protein per day, but with zero beta-conglycinin, okay? So they were, these subjects were drinking uh, for three months, 500 milliliters per day of either one of these milk. The production of the milk was in association working with the industry, and it's important to emphasize the importance of teaming up with industry. You know, academia and industry can produce a synergistic um, results, very, very important for science and for the consumer. So we were very blessed to have the participation of different industries and uh, all the samples were processed at the same time under exactly the same conditions to produce the Tetra Pak where we had, had all the mix process and package. So the volunteers were able to uh, collect their monthly the monthly allowance, let's say, per, per, per um, each one of the meals they were drinking. 
um, some of the um, characteristics of the subjects, the volunteers here, you can see there were not a statistical difference among the people participating either in what we call LGS, the low glycine in soy milk or the conventional soy milk, uh, or the bovine milk. No, no statistical differences among all of these characteristics. So uh, we selected uh, similar or uh, very similar, I would say, subjects for this study. Some of the results here, we, what we can see are changes in body fat in overweight men affected by consumption of soy milk or bovine milk during three months. And I invite you to take a look at the group treatment conventional soy, low glycine in soybean and bovine milk. And then maybe we can move to the right where we see the relative difference of, uh, of, the, of, um, of weight, right? Body, body fat, in this case, body fat. And I highly encourage you to see the results of the individuals that drank every day uh, low glycine in soy milk, meaning this had almost 50% of beta conglycinin as part of the 12 grams of protein per day that they were drinking in that uh, soy milk. So it's very interesting to see that there was a statistical difference here in, in body fat. But more than just fat, let me share with you results of other markers. When we mm, took blood samples and analyzed serum samples, we saw a very important parameter, oxidized low density lipoprotein, what was the relative difference uh, and uh, the decrease, the decrease of this uh, in the different groups. So the first one is LGS, which is the very high beta conglycinin, almost 50% of beta conglycinin in the soy milk. And the decrease was very highly significant from the other two groups, the conventional soy milk and soy milk and just milk. So it's important to highlight that individuals were uh, protected, you know, because the oxidized LDL decreased. And also to your right, you can see the increase in adiponectin, mainly for this high concentration of beta conglycinin or what we call low glycinin soy protein. And in the bottom part, you see the plasma interleukin. This protein is associated to inflammation. And we saw for both soy milks a decrease a decrease in inflammation um, regardless of the type of protein that was present versus the milk that did not decrease plasma interleukin. Uh, I'm not going to present those results, but we also analyzed for saponin and isoflavones, and these two contain the same amount, so we could maybe think that isoflavones and saponins play a role in decreasing interleukin-6 in plasma. Uh, finally, from that study, I want to share with you the antioxidant capacity that both milks presented in plasma of these individuals. So the antioxidant capacity increased in both uh, milks, uh, in the plasma of both um, groups of people drinking this milk, the conventional soy and the high beta conglycinin or low glycinin soy. So this is important because we didn't remove anything. It was complete um, milk, right, produced from soybean and versus the milk, the bovine milk that did not present protection to these individuals increasing, didn't increase the antioxidant capacity. So those are some studies, uh, studies I wanted to share with you from the full soy. So what happens if we study particular peptides? Can we produce those peptides and then provide the consumer with ingredients rich in some peptides that could prevent um, either cardiovascular disease or diabetes or other conditions? Uh, we can sequence those peptides, use molecular docking. So I want to share with you how to go about to do this or how, at least how we have done it. Let me start saying that soybean is a very good source of bioactive peptides. Just take any molecule, any protein in soy. This is one example for alpha conglycinin beta subunit. And you can see peptides with antihypertensive properties, immunomodulatory properties, antioxidant, eh, etc. So, in summary, peptides present in soybean proteins are rich sources of bioactivity. 
lunacine in particular, this molecule that is so easy to extract and purify from soy because this is part of the albumin, very soluble in water protein. And it has shown a very interesting sequence, sequence of amino acids. We have purified throughout the years. We have done many animal studies, mainly targeting the modulation and privation of cancer. It's a very interesting molecule, easy to purify. My students will say, no, it takes time. And it's not that easy, I know, but it's it's easier uh, to purify and we have done some human studies to demonstrate bioavailability of this uh, lunacine molecule and also study roles on inflammation. If you analyze soybean products, for sure you will find lunacine present because it contains uh, albumins and you will find lunacine present in many products commercially available and we have done that in several products. Uh, this is the study where we determine the bioavailability of lunacin in volunteers and they were eating either soy protein powder or this fresh, freshly prepared whole soybean chili dish and we were able to demonstrate the bioavailability of lunacin in plasma of these objects. So this figure shows the amount of lunacin in nanograms per milliliter of plasma um, versus different conditions of uh, isolation of lunacin. This is when we were trying to test the methodology and see which methodology would be the best to isolate this lunacin. But the bottom line, the summary is lunacin is able to be absorbed and present in plasma of men that were consuming 50 grams of soy protein, you could say is high, but yeah, if you drink two glasses of milk, and maybe a dish of um, chili, <laughs> uh, chili bean based on soy, you are, you, are, you are eating 50 grams of soy protein per day. So let's move on to what we can do with soy proteins or any other protein, right? Uh, usually it's important to start with in silico prediction of the potential bioactivity by enzyme. So you can do enzymatic production of peptides from proteins, optimize this production and use these different databases like Uniprot, Expasi. Uh, I, I recommend this to look at the uh, structure of the proteins and then you can produce and optimize uh, the production of peptides based on what you are looking for. Are you looking for peptides that will decrease cardiovascular disease? Then you can predict in silico how to produce those peptides using different enzymes, different proteases, different ratios, enzyme, substrate, uh, different times. And yeah, you can, you can look at those before you actually start doing studies of simulated gastrointestinal digestion and what happens to those peptides after we eat them, right? Because we want to eat them <laughs> and, and we need to know what transformation happens during gastrointestinal digestion. Characterize the peptides, learn who they are, and then do some um, molecular docking with the specific enzymes or proteins that could be important to know, okay, are these peptides able to inhibit uh, fatty acid synthase or uh, alpha glucosidase or dipeptidyl peptidase associated with diabetes or many other markers. So we can do this in silico, which is relatively uh, easy and um, not expensive to, to do it. So you have predictions and you can uh, know which peptides will have the higher probability of have uh, inhibition for certain diseases. And of course, we do in vitro studies with different cells because we want to learn the mechanism of action, how they act, how they can promote decrease of inflammation or adipogenesis or production of, of, of certain oxidized um, cholesterol components and, and then move to in vivo and human studies for validation. So this is just, a, a, you know, overview of what can be done targeting a specific diseases and maybe you can produce an ingredient that could be consumed for human health. At the moment, let me tell you that we continue interacting with food industry and they fund our, some of our studies and we talk to scientists. 
scientists in different companies. So we propose different analysis. In this case, you see the InfoGest harmonized method for gastrointestinal digestion. We are testing about 18 different varieties of soybean with different protein profiles and looking, first of all, what happens or what would happen if we eat them at the mouth level with uh, salivary amylases, at the, gastric, as the, at the gastric level with lipases, at the intestine level with uh, pancreatine and other gastric enzymes, and also at the colon, colonic level with pronase and uh, viscosine and others. So we simulate, this method has been validated worldwide. So it's good to know that we can use this method to uh, explore what is produced after gastrointestinal digestion and then test it in vitro uh, to see the biological activity. So as a summary, we study the duodenal digestion, colonic and full digestion of these um, hydrolysates to look for biological activity. Using LC mass spectrometry, MSMS, you can characterize the peptides, know about the molecular mass, the hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity, and many other bioactive properties that these peptides you are producing have. Here, we did it with pepsin pancreatic and also uh, different peptides that were produced with bromelin. So you can test different hydrolysates. And finally, include um, different enzymes that you can look at inhibition or potential inhibition using molecular docking. Is it... Boa tarde a todos. Tivemos um certo probleminha técnico aqui. Em breve retornaremos com a palestra da professora Elvira de Merria.
uh, what happened? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. What happened? I don't know. We lost your connection. When? Um. Oh no! Don't tell me that. About five minutes ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm very it's sorry okay. about that. Uh, in which slide you lost my connection? Um. Let's see. Oh my God! I'm very sorry. Do you want me to repeat parts of it, or shall yes. we ask questions? So where where did you lose the connection? Uh, can you share your slides? So yeah, I'm sharing them now. Can you see them? Um, not yet. Wow, what happened? <laughs> it happens. Shared screen. Um, because can you see the slides now? Not yet. Let's. I'm. I'm gonna see here with Professor Hiki. Can you see them now? Um, yes, we can okay. see it. So do you remember more or less where? Uh, I think two, ne two next. You already, we watched this one. You saw this one? No, you can, yeah, this one. Okay, so you lost it from here? Yeah. Okay, do you want me to repeat from here? Are, 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 is the audience present? Yes, it is. Everyone is, is paying okay. attention. I'm very sorry about that. So I, I was just talking about the identification of the different peptides uh, present in, in the products. And we can use um, mass spectrometry for the characterization of these peptides and learn more about their hydrophobicity, their isoelectric point, and the molecular mass. And of course, we can also learn about the biological activities. It's very common to use molecular docking to analyze the interaction of those peptides with different enzymes, for instance, alpha amylase related to type 2 diabetes. And you can also uh, learn about the interaction in different sites of the enzyme to look at potential interaction, like in, in here, in dark, in uh, black, you can see the name and last name using one letter of the different amino acids and how they can interact with the active sites of molecules. Uh, um, for instance, we can learn about how these enzymes, in, uh, these peptides can inhibit um, fatty acid synthase or uh, the peptidyl peptidase enzyme or many different enzymes that participate in important biological activities. Uh, so, as a summary of my talk, I wanted to say that peptides have the potential as unique and novel agents for human health. And as I show you in my presentation, you can select some products with good in vitro capabilities of inhibiting inflammation and take those products for human intervention studies. There is the need for human intervention studies. Uh, as I show you in our human study, three months of low glycine in soy milk, uh, um, increase plasma deponectin and decrease oxidized LDL in overweight men. And uh, I mean, also we saw maybe a modest inhibition of body fat, but we saw some inhibition of body fat uh, for this low glycine in soy milk uh, they, they were ingesting. So recommendations, Dr. Lehman, you can follow him. He's a a nutritionist uh, giving recommendations on protein consumption. Uh, he says that we need to eat a variety of high protein products and consume them early in the day and obtain a large portion of proteins from, from soy protein and other, also other sources of protein. What is next? What is the future directions? Well, I think it's important to identify new bioactive soy peptides and their in vivo biological function. Uh, study new commercial products or produce new products uh, using different techniques, high pressure and others, and, and see what is the effect on industrial processing on bioactive peptides. Are we destroying the biological activity of proteins and peptides? So it's important to determine what is the uh, biological capacity of the peptides after industrial processing. So that's all what I have. I'm sorry about the interruption, but 
If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. <clears throat> so thank you, Professor Elvira de Mejia. Uh, we have several questions here. Everybody is loving your talk. Thank you. So I'll be the first one asking. Okay. Uh, I have a question about lunazine. So there are several in vitro and some in vivo studies on its anti-cancer activity. From your experience, can you talk a little bit about the limitations of using this peptide as a possible drug? Yeah, you know, I'm a food scientist. <laughs> So uh, when I start hearing about dietary supplements and drugs, um, it's a little bit outside my specialty. I want to recommend the consumer to eat uh, complete foods. And if those foods contain lunacin, that's great. Maybe we are protected and the risks are um, reduced, you know. Um, um, it could be, yeah, it could be some time that that could be used as a pharmaceutical. Uh, maybe not, not as such. It has to be a cover or protected against uh, digestibility because when we did our bioavailability study, we saw a reduction in plasma, at least in plasma, of the original lunacin. Does that mean that the pieces that the enzymes cut are bioavailable? That's something to study. We do not know if the RGD motif is, is bio, bioactive and could be protecting the body, even though the levels of lunacin in plasma were low, but probably the pieces of lunacin that are very unique, uh, not many molecules show that chemical structure uh, or sequence of amino acids, probably the body is protected with those biological activities. But yeah, it will have to be protected. And as I said, this student, his name is, is Eric Damian Castaneda Reyes. Uh, he just finished that study, ready to be published, uh, and he um, protected lunacin with liposomes, some liposomes, and protected in those liposomes, he saw activity against the, the uh, production of tumors in, in, can in, in, in animals that were exposed to cancer tumors, melanoma, melanoma. And, and he determined and showed that protection. So uh, probably, yes, the answer could be yes, but uh, you need to protect uh, lunacin somehow until we demonstrate that um, the digested lunacin is effective in humans. Okay, thank you. I have another one. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between research at institutes and university and industry in the United States? Because here in Brazil, both are still very distant without much investment from the industry. Yeah, uh, because uh, sometimes the, um, the consortia are here in the U.S., you know, let's talk about the Kellogg's, the General Mills, the ABMs, the, you know, those kinds of big companies. So they develop institutes, research institutes in their matrix here in the U.S., and, and they do research there. They do research, they have pilot plans, they produce, um, uh, yeah, I, I'm very familiar with many companies here in the US that they do the research, but they cannot do everything. So teaming up with researchers like my group and others, many others, is very useful, very important for them because we bring to the table new ideas. Uh, we are capable of doing very detailed, in-depth studies that they cannot do or they usually don't do. Maybe they do the processing of new products, maybe they do big picture um, research, but they don't go to mechanistic studies or they don't test uh, humans for, for a study. So uh, the synergy that we have um, known, you know, throughout now I'm many years here at the University of Illinois and through those many years, I always team up with companies. Uh, and it, it's funny, I don't look for them. They look for us. How? Because of the publications. They say, oh, you publish this and you say this. Can we do some research to test these other products or to do research? And I'm very clear to them that we are not going to analyze samples. We are not testing. We are not a testing laboratory. We are a research laboratory. So uh, we talk to their scientists, they usually have PhDs in nutrition, in food science, in sensory, 
in different areas. So we talk directly with scientists and we agree on what our experimental design will be, what our hypothesis will be. So it's always a hypothesis-driven research. We don't accept just testing samples because that will, you know, uh, deviate our main goal of discovery. So we want to discover it and, in, and innovate. And then we can do that with companies. Yeah. Well, I don't great. know if your question, Vianne. Uh, it's perfect. So we have a few questions here in the live chat. So Gustavo Fortunato asked, is there any relation between high allergenicity proteins and their peptide toxicity? Hmm. Interesting. So is he asking that if this, for instance, this P34, that is an allergenic protein, uh, produces toxic peptides? Yeah. Is that the question? If there's a relation between. Yeah. I don't know. I do not know. I know that there are some peptides that are bitter peptides, um, but those bitter peptides have been related to decreased diabetes. They are not toxic. So that's a great question. I do not know the answer. I can look for it and see if someone else has done it. I have never done it. I have purified P34. I have uh, decreased the toxicity of P34 with fermentation and germination. So I know how we can decrease the toxicity of P34. But I don't think we have never analyzed the peptides fro produced from P34. Uh, and that's a great question. So, so we need to learn about that. I, I do not know. I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. We have another question from Andre Luis Sabac, and he asks, what are the best forms of consumption to obtain biological results? Would be supplements with soy-based concentrates or soy feeding you would give the same results? Right. Again, um, as a food scientist, I encourage people to eat full, full, whole foods, whole foods. Uh, dietary supplements are dangerous because sometimes the consumer doesn't realize that sometimes these are mega, mega doses. I can buy lunacin as a dietary supplement, but how much should I eat that is safe to my body? We do not know, right? We know the concentrations that are present in milk, in, um, in, in soy, in whole soy and different products, but uh, how much is safe for you to eat from a dietary supplement. And Gente, acho que tivemos uma queda novamente da professora Elvira de Merria. É, em breve ela retornará. Vamos esperar só mais um pouquinho. Maybe.
hear me? No. Let's see. Y yes, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah. You're back. Professor, can you hear us? Can you see us? Hi, can you Hi. <laughs> you're back again. I don't know. I don't know why this is happening. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. It's it's what usually can happen at an online event. Okay. Do you have any other question? Um, yeah, I have a question from Professor Ederlan Ferreira. He says, Professor Elvira de Mejia, thank you very much for your participation in our second international symposium of food science mm -hmm. and he he asks since 1999 the u.s food and drug administration the fda has considered that the consumption of 25 grams of soy protein per day has a preventive effect on the incidence of heart disease but few products are marketed with this appeal what is still missing yeah he has to say low fat <laughs> in uh, under a low fat diet right so is missing that yes of course 25 grams of soy protein per day uh, consum consuming consumption with the consumption of a low fat low fat diet so it's not just consuming 25 grams of soy protein per day but you have to be active do exercise and consume a low fat, fat diet so yeah that continues uh, there have been many attempts to lower the amount suggested but no changes uh, up to now this continues yep but it's um, needed to indicate that it's a low fat diet in an active environment you know so yeah um, thank you that, <laughs> that Alechi asked do you believe that active peptides are the future for the production of new drugs um could be um Maybe molecules similar to these peptides, maybe could be, you know, um, it's always, it always happened like uh, metformin, for instance, was taken originally from natural sources and the molecule was transformed to a more active product. So it's possible, yes, it's possible that those molecules could be improved uh, to be used as a pharmaceutical. Yeah, it's possible. Yes, that opens many possibilities to look at specific motifs, right? And, and sequences of amino acids and maybe use some of those. Yeah, it's possible. Um, Vito Luis asked, can you talk about the practical applications of these peptides? In what ways are they available for people to use? Are they already available in forms other than food? You know, when I work with the food industry, what they are interested is okay i have these so many soybeans potential varieties of soybean can you tell me which one will produce more bioactive peptides when humans eat them and, and that's one important question uh, yellow pea chickpea uh, soybean common bean so many products that could be selected from the field uh, that uh, you can as a food scientist or a bi biotechnologist or a professional in this field can do a simulated gastrointestinal digestion and look at the potential of these peptides to be better than from different other varieties. Um, so that's what companies are looking at the moment. 
which varieties are the ones that after humans eat them or animals eat them, uh, can give them the very best uh, health benefits. Uh, other companies are looking at certain enzymes that can produce ingredients. Um, certain companies are looking for enzymes. Which enzymes? Bromelin or uh, papain or thysin or, or enzymes that have never been used but if are from grass, right, generally recognized as safe enzymes, can be used to produce peptides. And then those ingredients incorporated them in um, bakery, in juices, in different products. So, uh, yeah, there is market for all of them, but I guess the main one right now is which variety of beans can I use to produce the, the healthier, the healthier uh, peptides that will benefit humans and animals. Yeah. And we have a key a comment from Thais de Souza Rocha. Please just let her know that I saw her presentation and I'm sending greetings. I had the opportunity to work with her at her lab a few years ago. Send my congratulations, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> nice to hear from you. Great. Hi, Thais. How are you? <laughs> she worked so hard, very hard, <laughs> probably so many papers. Yes. It's a pleasure uh, to have had you in my lab, Thais. Yes. <laughs> So, Professor Vira de Mejia, once again, on behalf of the organizing committee of the Second International Symposium on Science, we thank you for your avail availability and for the brilliant presentation made. It was thank an outstanding you. lecture and had a great contribution to everyone present here. Thank you so much. And I can share with you the slides if you want to share them with them. So, thank you so much. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, bye. Então, agradecemos a todos os participantes do segundo simpósio de alimento, internacional de alimentos SINCA. De, desculpa. Segundo simpósio internacional de ciência de alimentos SINCA, que estão acompanhando pela transmissão ao vivo através do canal no YouTube. Aguardamos encontrá-los novamente no dia de amanhã com o um minicurso do professor Samuel Silva da Rocha Pita, intitulado Abordagens em Sílico, Aplicadas e Compostos Bioativos, a partir das 9 horas, com transmissão ao vivo pelo canal do YouTube. Então, nos encontramos amanhã. Obrigada a todos.